old basic. Students are still using it to do programming assignments and computer classes, but hardly anybody else is. This is the era of visual programming tools, making it easier to develop customized applications, even in complex graphics environments like Windows. Today, we'll take a look at visual programming languages on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. Computer Chronicles is brought to you in part by Intel, microprocessor technology for the software of today and tomorrow. Intel, the computer inside. Additional funding is provided by the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Schaffe, and with me today is George Fiebisch. George is the co-author of this book, Windows Rapid Application Development. And in this book, George, you talk about something called the Marvel Technique for using Visual Basic. Show me how you would use this technique in Visual Basic. I'm going to show an example of building a fairly complex function, which is a graph, which may be fed from some data from a database. Mm -hmm. And here I've created the graph, and now I'm going to give it a, a title, uh, Sales 1992. And I've got my graph without any programming. Now, using this uh, in an actual program, I can load uh, up a program here. And this is going to show us two graphs side by side. And in this interface, by clicking on the graph, the user can select that they would like to see it as a 3D Pi and this one as a uh, line type graphic. And this is done with very few lines of code. So hardly without writing any code, you not only created the graph, you created the interface for the user to decide what kind of graph he wants. That's correct. Now, what is Marvel, then? What is this technique? Marvel is a technique for minimizing the amount of code that must be written by using functions that are already there, something mm -hmm. like hardware uh, ICs. Yeah. All right, today we will look at six visual programming languages for the Macintosh and for Windows. Now, one of the first visual programming languages for Windows was Toolbook from Asymmetrics. We'll start out today with a visit to Blue Shield, where they use Toolbook to write custom applications. When employees at Blue Shield visit one of the personal information kiosks at their workplace, they can access their savings plan account, review job listings, check the latest company activities, or shop for bargains. My idea was to come up with a way to provide information to employees that um, would give them information faster, consistently, and hopefully at the same time cut paper costs and allow us to use some of our resources to do more project-related efforts. Programmer John Kunkel used Toolbook by Asymmetrics to write a series of custom applications. This was his first experience using a visual programming language. It's much simpler uh, because you can actually draw your screens first, which actually takes probably the most time. It actually takes more time than uh, programming. Uh, so you design your screens first and then add the script afterwards. Uh, and also you can test right away as, as you're actually programming. You can actually test it immediately to see if that works. Despite the ease of use of a visual programming language like Toolbook, when Blue Shield wanted to add a higher level of interactivity to their application, they called on a programming consultant. We wanted to put in um, access to our SQL server and also print out an, an enrollment in enrollment form. Those were some things we hadn't done before in our, in our initial application, so that's why we went out looking for a, a consultant who maybe had some experience with Toolbook that we didn't have. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Janelle Patterson. The, the point of it is that uh, you, can, you can do things like this, like a little game of, of uh, blackjack, without a great deal of effort in a, in a way. On the Mac, there are two leading visual programming languages, Prograph and Sirius. We'll take a look at both now with Phil Cox of TGS Systems, based in Halifax, Canada, and also with us Joe Firmage of Sirius Corporation, and you're based in Salt Lake City. 
Phil, let's start with you and talk about ProGraph. And it, believe it or not, in a couple of minutes, I guess, we're going to build or at least modify a piece of an application right, using ProGraph. Right, yeah. And show us what the application what is. What we have here, Stuart, is a, um, uh, a personal database application pre presenting an address book with names and addresses and telephone numbers and so What's forth. What's the screen right now we're looking at before you get we're to We're looking that? at the uh, part of the class hierarchy that is provided with uh, ProGraph for building okay. applications. You can see, in fact, there's a selected class called address book, which is the window for our address book application. Let's run it and see what it looks like. So this is the application as it exists. This is the running application, yes. You can see that the, the window has on the left some uh, editable text boxes which uh, we can either type information in and then click the Add button which will add a record to the database mm -hmm. and in fact insert the uh, corresponding name in the scrolling list. Or we can select elements of the scrolling list and the details will appear in, the, mm -hmm. uh, in these boxes. Okay, what we're going to do is modify this application uh, to uh, improve its functionality by allowing people to be deleted from the database. Okay, how do we do that? Well, uh, we want to put a delete button on this window first, so I will enter the editor, which turns the uh, window editor on. I want a button that looks pretty much like that one in size and shape, so I will simply select that and say replicate object. So you're, you're editing the program even while the program even is up and running. running yeah. yeah, which is a very powerful feature of this environment because you can flip backwards and mm -hmm. forwards between the two. Okay, I'm going to double click that button to change its identity to delete and the name of the method to be called to delete also. You want a slash or uh, well, Yeah, marker, that, that yeah. should be a slash. I'm okay. sorry, I keep pressing the... Yeah. There we are. Okay. okay. So now I've edited that button. There it is. I can exit the editor and go ahead and uh, execute this button. So I click delete but and <laughs> ProGraph hasn't found the method called delete. It doesn't exist. So instead of saying that this is wrong, it's saying, would I like to create it now? Okay, while it's so you've created the button but not yet the operation. But not the operation, okay. yeah. So I say OK. Now it's saying, where should I, which class should I create this method in? And it's correctly identifying class address book as the right place. So what has happened now is it's made the method and it started to execute it, and this is a picture of it under execution. So I'll move it down there. Now, I can get an editing version of this window by double-clicking the background. So it looks similar, but this is where I can actually write the data flow, which is going to bring this all to mm -hmm. life. So I can take the window and feed it into an operation called deselect. When I press the return key, ProGraph discovers that address book is where this method is located. Okay. This operation has one input and one output, and the output is the index in the list of the item being deselected. The next thing I want to do is remove from the database the item corresponding to the selected item in the list. So I feed this index in here so it knows which item in the database is being removed. And the last thing I want to do, I'll just clean this up by dragging those operations over, is to update the interface. So I will feed the window into an operation called update. Again, this is identified to be in class address book. Mm -hmm. And I will make sure that that update occurs after the item has been removed. So let's go back here and uh, execute this. And I can step through it with the return key. OK, mm -hmm. that deselected the item in the scrolling list. That remove, removed the item from the uh, database. Mm -hmm. And that updated the interface. That finishes the execution. OK, if I'm happy with that, I can turn off the step show mode, close the program window, and now I just have my running application. I can select, delete, and it works. select, delete, and it works. It yeah. was great. So it's top-down yeah. development. All right, Joe, let's talk about Serious Workshop and how is your approach to developing on the Mac different from what we just saw with ProGraph? Well, basically, it's, it's the difference between using smaller Legos and larger Legos. Serious's object components are very large grain pieces that allow you to build applications more rapidly. Mm -hmm. All right, can you show us how you would build something using Serious Workshop? Well, the Serious Workshop environment provides you a floating palette of icons, each of which represents an, uh, a noun or a verb in computer functionality. So for the address book application we're building, I need a window to display this information. So I find that window icon in this list and drop it into our workspace. So that's a function to create a window. That is a window okay. itself, and it contains all the code necessary to run it behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. There's actually about 20,000 lines of code behind that icon. Just so click. That's right. Okay. So inside of the window, I would like to display the name of the friend or family member in the address book, 
the address of that person and the telephone number. Mm -hmm. And we'll give these items names so that I know which is which. And I'd also <clears throat> like to be able to store lots of, of these names, addresses, and phone numbers. In order to do that, I need to store them in a database. So we drop in a database component. That contains the data management code. Mm -hmm. And when I double click on an object, I edit its attributes. So if I double click on the window, I get to give the window a title such as address book, choose a visual style, and tell the window which items to display inside of itself. And when I press layout, I see a working example of this window and we'll just position these fields any which way, like mm -hmm. so. We won't bother making it pretty for the time being. And we're finished with the layout of the address book fields. Now, I also need to double click on the database object and tell it to store name and address and phone number in the files, like that. The last step in this application is to provide a palette of buttons to add a record and delete a record. You saw in the program demo two of those buttons, mm -hmm. but also find and, and uh, update and so forth. <coughs> so we're going to drag over a browser component, which you will get an idea of the functionality that it provides when I put it inside the window as well as the other fields. And it provides, oh, about uh, a dozen or so common database operations. And again, you were able to do that just by clicking the browser operation. That's correct. And if I double click on it, I tell it to operate on my friends and family database. Mm -hmm. So now these buttons are live and intelligent and know what to do. And we're finished with this application at this point. We will choose Run from the project menu. And uh, <clears throat> in about 10 seconds or so, it will create a new executable application. So it's cranking together the code behind all those objects you put in there. That's correct. And now you will see it run on the screen. OK, how do we use this now? We will proceed to create a file by pressing the New button. And we'll just call it uh, Friends, like so. And uh, I'll put some names of, of friends in this file. I have a friend named uh, Rick. Mm -hmm. And uh, his, he lives in Texas. And his phone number is, uh, oh, I don't know, 619-555-1212. Mm -hmm. And add him to the database. I could also add Sarah, who lives in Salt Lake City. And her phone number is uh, that. We'll add that record to the database. Then I could browse through the people in this database or find where Rick lives by typing in Rick and pressing uh, the yeah. Find button. Hmm. You see? So in about two, three minutes, you created the application, and, and boom, you were using it right away. That's correct. And using the other objects and functions, we can refine it and improve yeah. it. All right, Serious Workshop is on the Mac here. Now, you also have a Windows version? That's correct. Any application you build for either platform within a matter of seconds can be up and running on the other. Mm -hmm. Phil, quickly, what level of user are things like ProGraph and Serious Workshop aimed at? Who's using this kind of programming language? Well, ProGraph is aimed at uh, uh, serious developers, and I don't mean a pun there, <laughs> um, within corporations okay. and also third-party developers and consultants. Mm -hmm. And the same idea for Serious Workshop? That's correct. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right, well, there is another visual programming language for the Macintosh. It's called HyperCard, and the latest version 2.1 is impressing the experts. Inventive Mac users know that you can write custom applications using HyperCard without having to face the steep learning curve of a traditional programming language. While HyperCard is easy to use, it is not really a visual programming language. Now the programming itself is still done in text, still done in HyperTalk or some, some extensions to HyperTalk, but the environment looks and feels graphically rich. And that's the critical issue. You're not sitting in an editor with a blank screen that dares you to type some meaningful code into it. It's providing you with a lot of visual support. You normally can't use HyperCard to build a standard Mac interface, but a new add-in tool from Heiser Software changes all that. We can start with HyperCard and a product called WindowScript from Heiser Software, in which we can build the full Macintosh interface, not just what HyperCard lets us do, color and pop-up menus and QuickTime movies and so forth. And then take the result of that work and create a standalone finder clickable application from it. We can get rid of HyperCard being around for the end user, reduce memory and other kinds of requirements, and create a really true standalone Macintosh application that you can't tell was written in HyperCard. 
Windows Script gives you what is essentially an upgraded version of HyperCard. These tools uh, effectively create what might have been HyperCard 3.0 if it had been developed that way by Claris because they add color, which everybody's asking for, they add the additional user interface components, and they add effectively a compiler. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Jonelle Patterson. On the Windows side, there are several visual programming languages. Among the best are the new Visual Basic from Microsoft and the new Visual C++ from Microsoft. Here to show them off are Cornelius Willis and Jeff Beeler, both, of course, from Microsoft. Cornelius, let me start with you and just position these two different products for me. What's the difference between Visual Basic and Visual C++? Well, Visual Basic is the tool you use when productivity is of the essence and you have to get an application put together quickly. Visual C++ gives you the full power and flexibility of the C++ language, and it also lets you create reusable components that can then be used mm -hmm. in Visual Basic applications. All right, let's start with Visual Basic then and show me how you would build something here using, using Visual Basic. Great. In Visual Basic, uh, you build your user interface with this set of components or custom controls. Um, there are all kinds of different controls here, things for user interface, things for uh, spreadsheet-like display, uh, here's a gauge control. There's also about a hundred custom controls available in the aftermarket from third parties. Everything from mainframe connectivity to neural networks okay. to so multimedia you can call up animation. an operation just by clicking on something there. Right, or okay. just by including it in your application. Okay. For example, I can put this text box here on the screen. Um, each of these controls has a set of properties. Uh, for example, I can change the font italic property here to true, and then that text box becomes italic. Mm -hmm. um, there's also context-sensitive help on everything in the language. I just position the cursor over an item, hit F1, and I get context-sensitive help with a code example mm -hmm. that I can then paste into my application. Um, what I thought I'd do today to show you Visual Basic is build a quick database application. Uh, Visual Basic includes the complete access back-end database engine. That gives you access to Paradox, mm -hmm. uh, XBase files, as well as client server and, and mainframe data. I put the data control here on, a form, on the form, and now I'm going to set its database name equal to this local access database, store DB. And then I'm going to point at a table in that access database, the employees table, which is, uh, as you might imagine, a, a database of employees. And I'll put a couple of more text boxes here. How about one more text box? And then I'll also put a, uh, a picture box here. Mm -hmm. Let's make this a little bigger here and sort out my real estate. Now I'll select all of these and point their data source at the data one control there on the form. So the query this control defined is now the, the mm -hmm. thing that will populate that, those controls. And one more thing I need to do, I need to set the auto size property on this picture box to true. Now I go through and point each of them at a field. In this one, in this case, uh, this will be the first name of the employee. This will be the last name mm -hmm. of the employee. And then this one will be the employee's photograph, which is down here as the photo field. Mm -hmm. And now if I hit Visual Basic's Run button, I have a nice little database viewer, which has mm -hmm. auto-sized itself out of control. <laughs> and one of the nice things about Visual Basic is that if I make a mistake, it's very easy to correct it. Mm -hmm. Let's just put this data control down here and it will work fine. Great. There you go. Super. So that, one, that was a test debug and run cycle in about right. two seconds. And you really just did this all on the fly here, huh? I did this all on the fly and, and I didn't have to write any code to, to build the database Jeff application. Jeff, let's turn to Visual C++ and I know there's no time to build a whole application using this right now, but you built one just before you came here and kind of run through the process for us anyhow. Sure. Um, I actually did write an application on the way out here. It's a multimedia player which uh, allows you to play multimedia files. As you can see, it's a full-featured Windows application already, and I, it only took me about 25 minutes. Mm -hmm. I got a toolbar and a status bar, menu, and this VCR control in my application. All I do is click on the VCR control, and you can see that I, uh, I, I'm able to play video files that are on my machine. Okay, so the application you created was the VCR player. That's correct. Okay, now show me how you did that. Sure. Um, the first step I took was at, uh, to run App Wizard. AppWizard does all the project startup work for you, creates um, uh, the source files and resource yeah, files. Now, what is this we're looking at here? This is the options dialog box for AppWizard. It shows you all the high-level application options which are available for, this, uh, for, for our new application. Okay. Now, let me show you some of the files that we created with AppWizard. 
These are the C++ and the uh, header files necessary uh, to create our application. I click on the RC file and that contains all the resources. So I go into resource editing mode in App Studio. These are all the resources which are in my application, things like icons and dialogues. Mm -hmm. I double click on a particular one and it brings up the dialogue editor which I can then um, edit uh, the UI of my application. Mm -hmm. now, I didn't actually write that VCR control. That's a visual basic component which I dragged and dropped into my application. And it's that easy just to in integrate uh, high-level application features in your application. Now let's see how I um, connected UI visuals to code. This is the class wizard and it, what it shows you is all of the objects in my application including that multimedia control. Mm -hmm. Now in this pane here you see that um, these are all the messages that can be sent to that particular control. So as I switch to a different object in my application, like the um, file play mm -hmm. menu item, I, I see a different set of messages. I double click on a message and it creates a member function for me. That member function is where I put the code to run the, when the user um, picks that menu item. I double click on that particular member function that takes me right into back into the visual workbench where I can edit the code and and create my application. Mm -hmm. So at this point I added about five more lines of code and built and debugged the application in the Visual Workbench. Now you can see how we've um, brought the power and productivity of C++ to a much easier usage um, by um, providing a visual mm -hmm. interface to yeah. all of this. All right, Jeff, who is using something like Visual C++? What is being written using this? Many Windows applications out there in the market today have been written with Visual C++, including Visual C++ itself. Uh -huh. um, so, I mean, you at Microsoft are using this to write applications. Absolutely. Many of our applications are written with Visual C++, and then another host of them are written with Visual Basic. Okay, and what about Visual Basic, then? How's that being used? Well, at Microsoft, we used it to write Microsoft Profit. Mm -hmm. um, Microsoft Profit was written entirely in Visual Basic. It's also used by many large corporations for, uh, for line of business applications. Some people still have kind of poo-poo basic or anything that's, that's derivative of basic. Is that, a, is that a, just too old primitive a language? Well, as we say, this is not your father's basic. <laughs> <laughs> that's obvious. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much. That is our look at visual programming languages. Stay tuned now for this week's computer news on Random Access. <laughs> In the random access file this week, Compaq has unveiled two home computer models in its new Presario line. Both can send and receive faxes and come bundled with software to reach the Prodigy and America online services. One model has a built-in telephone answering machine. Compaq will sell the Presario line through various retail outlets. Logging onto the internet will be as easy as turning on your TV in the city of Boston starting early next year. Continental Cablevision will offer an internet hookup that will feed directly into customers' television sets. It won't be cheap, though. The initial cost will be about $100 a month. Panasonic will begin shipping its new SideRider laser quality portable printer next month. The SideRider stands 14 inches high and weighs just 14 pounds. It comes in two versions, PostScript and PCL, and will sell for under $1,000. Apple is offering a free CD-ROM gift pack containing music and animation videos to students and teachers who purchase new Macs this fall. The Back to School freebie comes with the purchase of seven Mac models, including the Color Classic, LC3, Centra 610, and the PowerBook Duo 230. MacPlay has turned learning how to type into a game with the release of Mario Teaches Typing. The animated tutor program runs at three different difficulty levels. Users can choose their own characters, Mario, Luigi, or the Princess, and can learn to type at their own pace. Now it's time for this week's Software Review with Paul Schindler, courtesy of CMP Publications. Today, we're going to look at a venerable print publication now available on CD-ROM for Windows, the Guinness Book of World Records, or as the product's known formally, the 1993 Guinness Multimedia Disc of Records. Of course, when you put a book on CD-ROM, people expect that you'll make all the text readily available, more readily available, in fact, than it was before. So press the walking fingers if you want something like a table of contents, or press the magnifying glass and enter some particular words or set of words you wish to look for. 
There's a superlative index. The icon shows a tall person and a short one. And there's the material that makes this a multimedia product, still pictures and movies. If you want to cut right to the chase, push either the picture in the frame or the movie camera, and you can limit your browsing to entries to which Guinness has added these elements. When you select such an entry, you see the record first. The 1993 Guinness Multimedia Disc of Records is $100 from Crowlier Electronic Publishing in Danbury, Connecticut. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. Kids as young as three years old will learn all about baby animals in the latest release from Knowledge Adventure. Kids Zoo, a baby animal adventure, features full motion video, music, digitized speech, photo quality images, and music in a variety of learning modules. And finally, Time Out Sports Technologies has released a program called the Hockey Commissioner's Office that automates the retrieval of NHL player statistics in a matter of seconds. Players in fantasy hockey leagues can subscribe for the season to download hockey statistics via modem. That's it for this week's Computer Chronicles. I'm Janelle Stelson. Computer Chronicles is brought to you in part by Intel, microprocessor technology for the software of today and tomorrow. Intel, the computer inside. Additional funding is provided by the Software Publishers Association, providers of educational materials to help manage software. Don't copy that floppy. Video cassette copies of this program are available. Computer Chronicles also publishes a companion newsletter containing details on products demonstrated and information on program topics. To order a video cassette or a newsletter, call 1 800 799 4949 or write Computer Chronicles. Please specify program subject for tapes. All orders include a free software program for auditing software use and information on the definitive guide to keeping your organization's software legal.